So I haven't really been doing much self-dialogue lately. Partly because I've been attempting to catch up on other things. But partly, I think it's because I'm still on a little bit of Seroquel. And I remember from last time how even when I was on one half, I think I did a video at the park where I was saying, I have no idea what to even say. And then that night I didn't take any. And then the next day I felt very talkative again. So I'm still taking half of a Seroquel, which I have for the last three days. And I'll continue to take half for a few more days just to make sure that it doesn't come up again because of how I'm in California and also how I want to get to ECPR. So I'd rather have a clear head at ECPR, but leading up to that, if I can just get myself to sleep and all that stuff, then that's good. And when I go off the Seroquel, if I finish coming off of it, then that means that I was able to take it quick enough to stop it from happening. And there was only a two month space between the last one and this one. So hopefully it doesn't happen every two months. And there's a chance I could run out of trazodone because I'm taking more than I usually do. So there's a lot of different factors that would lead me to go home early, but it's looking like I'll get to ECPR and hopefully I'll get past mid-May and hopefully I'll get to the end of July. Hopefully with this hearty nutritionals, I'll be able to go off the trazodone because I have gone for long periods of time not being on trazodone at all. And today I was feeling kind of tired and bleh, I'm not sure if I'm starting to experience that over-medication effect that the hearty nutritionals can do. And tomorrow will actually be the one year since I was hospitalized when it wasn't good. That was a year ago tomorrow. And then I was in there for 19 days and in a step down for two weeks, so 33 days. So starting tomorrow, this time last year, I was in the scariest situation ever. And it's awesome that a year later, I'm in California, living my dream, stumbling a little bit, but still doing it and having a good time. The most difficult thing really is having a routine of feeding myself because it's so beautiful that taking care of oneself is an afterthought. I kind of miss straightening my hair and maybe that's it. And I'm kind of skipping all over the place in my notebook, trying to go back to where I left off somewhat and just talk about some of this stuff. Could be good to still talk about it even when I'm a little bit drugged to even just show the difference between drugged self-dialogue and not drugged. So here it goes. I've been thinking about language a lot, but not really because I'm drugged out, so I haven't been thinking about much, but it seems like I was thinking about language and writing stuff down at some point. 
And I feel like our brains are cultured and raised on thought. In that we hear people when we're developing speak about the me and the past and the future. So we learn those language structures and we're, we're cultured in that. We're cultured in the language of me by a bunch of me speaking about the me. And this is structured in the language with subject, object, verb. And I wonder if we can create a present moment language and be cultured in that where we don't meet each other with our past, but we meet each other with what is present. And not just what's happening inside as in that's what's present, but what is actually there in the moment. Perception of the actual. And in that way, we're not divided because we're meeting with what we all share, which is everything around us except for our physical bodies. And I wonder if the brain wants to be present or not because it seems like it's always running away with thought, wanting to be somewhere else and all that kind of stuff. But maybe it does that because we're not speaking as the present. So the me always wants to be somewhere else. But the me isn't the brain, it's just this construct over the brain. Perhaps the brain actually wants to be present, but the me can't be. Because the me is sort of this foreign entity in the brain that warps it away from just seeing and being and speaking as the present moment. And I wonder if the brain is trying to create a culture of presence and not just culture as in society, but actually presence is what is the true culture of the brain for the brain to grow. It needs to see and be in the present to actually grow and change neuroplastically, otherwise it's not really changing in quality at all. So something else grows when we're present. The brain wants to be whole, but it's the me that divides it up. And I think the language we speak inside is dopamine. Dopamine. And I think we speak dopamine English. It's English that gets us a hit of dopamine. The way we use our words externally, the way we use our words internally, we use that language to get dopamine and it's tied into the dopamine reflex. So it's English that produces dopamine. And I wonder if there's English that produces oxytocin. And really, to share and feel connected when in a way needs to be present. So part of that could be oxytocin and it could be a reason why someone in map consciousness has a lot of oxytocin traits. And I think the brain is trying to actually create a state even beyond oxytocin, which is beauty. And I think I've seen that dimension somewhat. And I read this study related to that and I can't really remember what it is, but it made me think something about that. But anyway, I'll get back to that some other time. And I was thinking about how some people do stream of consciousness writing where they just write and write and write and write and write and don't think. And in a way, can we have stream of consciousness seeing where we just see and see and see without thinking and when we see in that way it produces sound different sound other than thinking and that sound might actually be something other than dopamine english
So perception creates a different way of using English. Not in service of the me, in service of the moment. And can we look as the moment, which is not a seeking state. When we're looking as the me, then we're seeking. We're seeking, we're looking for something when we're looking as the me. But when we look as the moment, we are that which we were looking for, so we just look. And I was thinking about cameras and how cameras capture and translate beauty. And if there was an image already on the lens of the camera, it would actually interfere with it, taking a beautiful picture. And when we project images and sounds as our thoughts, it's in the way of our lens. And another part of the camera analogy is that the camera doesn't talk about itself, it just captures and translates beauty. And those pictures are worth a thousand words. So when we can see with clear perception and take a full video moment to moment of the totality, we can choose with each frame a thousand different words to say about it. So can we create a language of the moment culture instead of a language of thought and the me and the past? It's kind of like improv in a way because in improv you can't really just talk about the me. You have to really play on the moment. One can only play in the moment. One can't play yesterday. So, And it's not really a fun game to always be talking about past stories and problems and things. So part of this language of the moment would definitely be play. I think mania is just a language of the moment. We're definitely very embodied in the moment through a lot of it. So where are the words are coming from or from a different place, different dimension in a way. And we speak different from that other dimension and when we first get in contact with that in map consciousness, we can sound rather silly because we say everything unfiltered. And we don't question how we use thought inside our head. It's always, think better thoughts, more powerful thoughts, affirmations. We don't question thinking in our head at all. So there's language inside our head and it's preformed going around in circles, and this pre-forming is part of the programming. We've been programmed to pre-form our words before we say them, but then they're always coming from that place in the past, and so we perform according to our conditioning. There's an undefined narrator and speaker, and I feel like all emotions are of the past if we recognize them as fear, when we have the fearful emotion, there'll be something from the past giving us a reason to be afraid. And I feel like emotions have a holographic quality in that the emotional molecule actually stores the information of what it is that we're emoting about. So it's not just fear, but the reason that we should feel fear, the little story, the image, the past event, and I feel like this is kind of how emotions put the break on map consciousness and bring one back down. Because when one is in the mania side of things, it's very rich and ecstatic and fluxing and flowing. And then all of a sudden, an emotion comes in. And it's almost like a, a brake pedal because... Before it was like this flow of different richness that is hard to define. And then as soon as it's like fear from the past coming in, it almost grabs that energy of mania and pulls it down. 
so I feel like this could be the brake system from a person being in map consciousness for too long. So they're not able to maintain that state and turn it into a trait or a stage. And something short circuits and the emotions coming in like that is part of it. So in so-called psychosis, there's a lot of fear. And if somebody was in a high state and goes into fear, they're going to be in a low state quite quickly. So they're almost like anchors, like you've gone too far into that state or been too long into that state and it's sort of burnt out energetically. And there could be things that we do in that state that lead us to also burn that out. And the emotion and the story when it comes in, like the fear or, the, or whatever it is, it's the me that tries to tether us back to the limited self. Again, putting the brakes on. It all of a sudden reminds us who we were when in mania we're sort of something totally different and changing all the time. We're really with the moment and then the emotion comes in and sort of puts us not in just the moment but in the whole context of our stored memories over time that in mania we forget about. And when we forget about them, we have all this energy. And then when they come back in, it pulls us down. And I'm not saying this is how it is or how it's bad for one and good for the other. I'm just saying it's interesting to think about. And I think emotions keep us separate from the world or help to keep us separate because it reinforces the me, which is a separative movement. And if we don't have that blocking us, we're sensitive and empathetic and using our mirror neuron system, not our emotional system. Our emotional system is chemical and the chemicals come in and produce holograms as well. Whereas if we are just with our mirror neuron system, it's based on light, the light of perception and sound as well, but actually receiving the whole impression of sound and light on our mirror and being able to make the calculation of responding adequately without thinking about it. It's a different calculation. You almost watch yourself act. Sort of like an emergency situation when you see something and you just act. You, you see what needs to be done right away. You just act. It's kind of like that. So the me and the emotions block the mirror neurons because the emotions are chemicals and holograms, whereas the quantum mirror is just light of perception and sound coming in, not inner sound blocking the sound coming in. And so it receives the whole quantum impression. And they're saying the universe is quantum. Well, the fabric is quantum and we move as that fabric and with that fabric and change that fabric because we are the possibility makers. And I was thinking that the quantum is a psychoactive substance, and so is perception. When we see clearly, it changes our brain, it changes our brain chemistry. Just like in mania, our perception is so clear and we're so sensitive, and it's psychoactive. We're not taking anything, but it's actually psychoactive. It's acting on our brains to perceive so clearly and act action and epigesturetics is psychoactive and it rewrites the DNA. So it's sort of genoactive as well. Seeing new renews the brain. And I think we who go into map consciousness being valued and understood for our unique contribution that we're still waiting to be able to make would be psychoactive for us and for the people that might listen. It would heal the way we're looked at and the way a lot of people look at themselves. It would heal the way we look together and the way we speak together. 
and it would heal a lot of things because people who go into map consciousness do come back with a lot of meaning and perspective, more so than they might have ever realized because they've never been invited to think about it or consider it or it's dormant or atrophied because of lack of use. Like one has to use one's gifts when one gets acquainted with those gifts so we don't use them then they kind of shrivel up but I feel like self-dialogue and context and meaning making and, and talking with each other might provide the hydration the nutrition the resonance the energy to to reawaken these gifts that we have the light that we have to meet coming out of other people's eyes depletes us and I think we need a quantum language we need a lot of different ways to use language than just past present future me you I we they there's so many more ways to to think about language whether it's speaking as the present moment speaking as perception, speaking as quantum, speaking as possibilities. Or even a language for when two people realize that they can think together on things, that they're actually not two separate minds and brains. And I think the way that we use words actually creates mental illnesses. With the labeling, of course, but even just the way we use language throughout our lives creates separation and loneliness and division and competition and coercion and, and every form of thing that's against the human nervous system. It's a culture of words, as in the nutrition of the words is, is off. It's weakening us. It weakens our nervous system and we're all repeating all of this and then we're not animating ourselves as our most beautiful selves because we don't have that language of beauty as the nutrition running through our nervous systems and, and in the thought sphere and soundscapes. And I feel like the me language, the current way language is used, limits neuroplasticity for sure and it's reverberating through our nervous system and keeping us limited and we're not animated by the universe and I think this is the major thing the energy isn't going through our nerves properly so one of the things would be to use language differently and if we think we have a mental illness then we stop thinking we stop wondering and we were born to wonder and I wonder if we can go beyond personal separative emotions to empathy and from molecules of emotion to the quantum mirror an impersonal screen that calculates the light and sound so it's a light of perception state, not a material state. So the light and sound hits the mirror and we act, but we don't go through this intermediary state of emoting and thinking. 